in just a matter of a few years. You don't even have to go back two decades uh, to see the explosion that's taken place. Some of you are in industries that have been affected by that, and you've seen uh, seen uh, what has transpired there. The, uh, uh, in fact, the time in which we're living is is called by many the information age, and there has been a mushrooming of information that is available and is available on such a quick. Uh, such a quick turnaround. Just within matters of minutes and hours, news just spreads all over the world. We can watch in our living rooms while war is going on on the other side of the planet. In the 19th century, there were many who felt that the solution to the problems and the social problems and the turmoil and all the difficulties that were being faced in society was the inauguration of universal free education. They thought that the solution was knowledge. Universal free education, that would solve the problems. Well, we've come a long ways. We've had universal free education for over a hundred years, and the problems of society have multiplied. There's clearly a paradox. Because there's knowledge and there's a multiplication of knowledge, and yet today very few understand the most crucial aspect of knowledge. And I want to focus our attention on that uh, this afternoon, on the most crucial aspect of knowledge that there is and the importance of it. Now notice here the paradox. It was prophesied on the one hand that there would be an explosion of knowledge. In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, it says, But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So the two things that were mentioned as characteristic of the end time was one, a transportation revolution, and the other was a communications revolution. And knowledge multiplication. The, the transportation revolution, we, we've certainly seen that in this century. If you go back... To, we're in the closing years of this century. If you go back to the beginning of this century, the average person transported himself the same way that people had been doing since the time of Adam. Primarily, they, they walked, they rode on an animal, or they rode in something that was pulled by an animal. Uh, they rode on a horse, or, or rode in a cart, or a buggy, or a wagon. I understand that there were locomotives, steam engines, back at the beginning of, of the century, but most people still, if they went somewhere, they walked or they rode in an, on an animal or in something pulled by an animal. There was, we have seen, that nobody had ever flown in an airplane. The first automobiles were, were simply prototypes. They were not uh, at all commonly available, and the vast majority of people, even in this country, had never even seen such a thing at the beginning of this century. Here we are in the closing, the closing decade of this century. We've already sent a man to the moon and successfully brought him back. Uh, it's nothing to get on an airplane and just a matter of a few hours later uh, to get off the airplane a half a continent or a full continent away. Uh, we, can, we can cross the Atlantic in just a matter of hours. Many shall run to and fro. We have seen this transportation revolution. And knowledge shall be increased. A virtual explosion of information. There's more information that comes out than any of us can even begin to absorb. And in many of the technical fields, by the time someone has gotten through college, much of what they've learned has already been made, ab uh, has already been made obsolete because of the rapid increase of knowledge in these areas. And yet, we're told in the book of Hosea chapter 4, notice verse 1, Hear the word of the Eternal, you children of Israel, for the Eternal has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. So on the one hand, we've had an explosion of knowledge, and on the other, we're told there is a lack of knowledge. There is no knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. 
Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwells therein shall languish with the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. You know, the description, swearing and lying and killing and stealing, committing adultery, sort of sounds like primetime TV. You know, that's what fills and permeates the nation. If we look at the entertainment industry, it's virtually all swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery. And it's just no end. One thing leads into something else. And it talks, therefore shall the land mourn. Coming on down in verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you shall be no priest to me. Seeing you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory to shame. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So on the one hand, there's been a knowledge explosion of technical knowledge and all sorts of information, the availability of knowledge, and yet there is no knowledge of God in the land. The people do not know God. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Not a lack of technical knowledge, but they have rejected knowledge. They have forgotten the law of God. They have turned away from God's law and the knowledge of God. As they were increased, so they sinned against me, God says. As our nation has increased in prosperity, as we have become more and more prosperous, as we've had more and more, it seems that we have turned further and further as a nation, as a people, from God. And that what knowledge of God was was had uh, has been turned away from more and more. Now, we have this paradox of an explosion of technical knowledge and information and yet an absence and an utter lack of the knowledge of God caused by a rejection of knowledge that is available. Now, God makes knowledge of Himself available. We are able to know God because God makes Himself knowable. God reveals Himself. Our knowledge of God is based upon God's self-revelation. In the book of Romans, we find in Romans chapter 1, one very clear aspect of God's self-revelation Romans chapter 1, we find uh, in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth or who hold back the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Here we have a progression from knowledge to a lack of knowledge. When the flood of Noah came and all humanity was wiped out, there were eight people. The total population of the earth consisted of eight people on board the ark. You know, there was nobody on board the ark that wondered, does God exist? They all knew God. They knew that there was a Creator God and they had seen His hand. When these eight people got off the boat, they knew and knew about God. But it didn't take long. Within a hundred years of the flood, Nimrod was building the Tower of Babel. There was a progression that took place. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. There was a progression that took place, and that progression is what can take place in any life. It is a progression that takes us away from the true knowledge of God 
and into a lack of knowledge of God. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. They ceased to be appreciative and to really glorify and praise and honor the great God of heaven. They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. They ceased to count their blessings and to be thankful and appreciative. They became vain in their imagination. They became filled with themselves and impressed with themselves. The consequence, the consequence was that their foolish heart was darkened. They began to lose knowledge and understanding. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. The smarter they thought they were, the dumber they really became. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. And you've got a progression that comes right on down. They became impressed with themselves and filled with a sense of self. And they began a progression into idolatry, of making pictures and images that really stood in the way of comprehending the true living God. They began a progression away from knowledge. This was a progression that cut off the human family from God. Because they ceased to glorify Him as God, they ceased to be thankful, and they became focused on themselves, became vain in their imagination. In the book of Exodus chapter 9, we find a little bit as to how God reveals Himself and makes Himself knowable. You see, God tells us in Romans 1 that the things of God are clearly seen. That, there, that people who reject the knowledge of God and who say there is no God are without excuse because the things of God can be seen from the creation around. God reveals Himself and makes Himself knowable to begin with through the creation. When you look at the creation, that demands a creator. You look at design, and that demands a designer. Life demands a life giver. There's no excuse for someone saying there is no God. When you see something that has been clearly crafted and designed... It is evidence of an intelligence that has created and crafted it. If you find a watch or you find some, some implement somewhere, that is clearly evidence that someone else has been here. Man has been here. You don't look and, and you know, if you were walking in the woods or you were walking in some remote area, we've just uh, I come through the 40th anniversary of the... Uh, Scaling of Mount Everest, uh, the uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and and the uh, uh, his Nepalese guide that uh, the two of them ascended Mount Everest 40 years ago. You know they, as far as anyone knew, and as far as they certainly knew, were the first people to ever set foot on top of Mount Everest. If they had gotten up there and found uh, some manufactured items, you know. Uh, found a couple of beer cans or whatever it is that people have left behind. Well, what would that have proven? Would they have immediately thought, you know, it's look, look at this, isn't this amazing, you know, what these rocks uh, evolved into uh, over the centuries? Well, no, they wouldn't have thought that. They looked at that and they said, somebody beat us here. You know, somebody else has been here first. When you see the evidence of intelligent design, you know that there has been someone who has had the ability to design and make that. When we look at the creation, we see something far more complex than any electronic equipment, than any watches, uh, than any kind of thing that we see around. The very Our very existence is human beings. And all of the creation, creation demands a creator. Design demands a designer. So God reveals Himself and makes Himself knowable through the creation. God makes Himself knowable through His intervention in the, uh, even in the natural world because God does intervene. Notice an example back in Exodus chapter 9. In Exodus chapter 9, we find that uh, uh, 
plague of the hail had been sent, and in verse 26, only in the land of Goshen was it not. And in verse 27, uh, Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron, and uh, he wanted them to entreat the Lord, in verse 28, that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail. And Moses said in verse 29, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the eternal, and the thunder shall cease. Neither shall there be any more hail, that you may know how that the earth is the eternal's. He said, I am going to go out and I'm going to ask God. I'm going to spread abroad my arms and I'm going to call on the great God to stop the thunder, stop the hail, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. I want you to understand something about the God that we worship and serve. He is the great Creator God. And He rules over the earth. Notice back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy 4.32 For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other whether there's been any such thing as this great thing or has ever been heard like it. Did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and lived? Or has God essayed to go and take a him a nation from the midst of another nation by all these great uh, trials and tests, signs and wonders and war, and a mighty hand and a stretched out arm according to great terrors, according to all that the Lord has done unto you. Unto you it was shown that you might know that the eternal He is God. There is none else beside Him. Verse 39, Know therefore this day and consider it in, the, in your heart that the eternal He is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath there is none else. You shall keep therefore His statutes, His commandments, which I command you this day, that it may go well with you and with your children. So God introduced Himself and made Himself knowable to the children of Israel by His intervention. And as Moses stood speaking to the generation that was going to go into the promised land, the generation that would go in after Moses' death, he said, ask of the days that are past. Go back and study history and think about and understand what has transpired before your time. Look at God's intervention as to how God called a nation out for Himself. Consider, here is the proof that the God we serve is God. All the gods, the pagan gods of the nations around, they are no God. They're not God. They don't have any power. They can't do these things. But the God we serve is the God of creation. He's the God who intervenes in the affairs of man and in the history of people. If we come back to Psalm 78, we find other examples of God's self-revelation. God's making Himself knowable. In Psalm 78, God says in verse 1, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I'll open my mouth in a parable. I'll utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We'll hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the eternal. His strength, his wonderful works that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which He commanded our fathers that they might they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know Him, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Now, here again we have... We have a principle, and this has to do with transmitting the knowledge of God. Transmitting the knowledge of God from one generation to the next, that the, that the generation to come might know. 
that the knowledge of God and God's intervention and God's working might be known. The purpose being that all might set their hope in God and not forget His works, but keep His commandments. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's power and God's greatness and God's working is tied in with our ability to know God and to keep His laws, to keep His commandments. God makes Himself knowable. He goes on and He speaks here of the children of Israel and their lesson of history. Here were people who did not follow through. We can learn from the way that God has dealt with others in the past. Here were those in verse 10 that kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in His law, forgot His works and His wonders which He had shown them. Marvelous things did He in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt and the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand up as a heap. He claved the rocks in verse 15 and gave them to drink. He brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. They sinned yet more against Him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. They tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. goes on down and it talks about how in verse 22, they believed not in God and trusted not in His salvation. Verse 24, He rained down manna, gave them the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. But in verse 32, and for all this they sin still and believe not for his wondrous works. So here we have an example over and over of God's working and how God dealt with his people in the past. God reveals himself through his historical dealing with his people. And it is important that that knowledge and that understanding be transmitted to generations to come. Because that's the basis of understanding about God is an understanding of the way God has revealed Himself in His workings with His people. But as we're told in Psalm 9 and verse 10, it says, They that know your name shall put their trust in you, for you, eternal, have not forsaken them that seek you. Now, it talks about the importance of knowing God, the importance of knowing God as He has revealed Himself, and here it talks about knowing His name. Now, what does that mean? You know, there are various groups that are called collectively the Sacred Names Group. And their great emphasis is that the important thing is you've got to know the Hebrew pronunciation of God's names and to use that rather than refer to God to, to use uh, some of the, uh, these, uh, uh, these terms. Here it talks about those that know your name. Now, what is it? what's important to know about knowing God's name? Is the important thing about God's name the phonetic sound? Well, the important thing of God's name is that the meaning of that name. In a biblical sense, names have meaning. Most of us have names that we're not consciously aware of the meaning. We don't think about the meaning of our names most of the time. Some of you may have looked up your name in some reference book and found out what it meant. But we don't generally think of the meaning of our names. But in the Scriptures, God names things what they are. And we find that, uh, for instance, Abraham, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. His name was changed to, be, to mean father of a multitude. Father of a multitude. God changed his name. Uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel from supplanter to prince with God, overcomer with God. God changes the names of various ones to, to represent some attribute or trait of character. God reveals Himself to us in the Scriptures by various names. He introduces Himself to us uh, as uh, Yahweh or the Eternal One. The thing that's important in, in their various uh, ways of pronouncing that. And you'll find that different ones may may say slightly differently. The thing that's important about the name of God is not the phonetic sound of it in a language that you that, that uh, uh, most of us have no understanding of at all. The thing that's important is the understanding of what God's names mean. Because God's names, when they were revealed in Hebrew, 
God's names meant something to the people who spoke Hebrew. God gave His name in Hebrew to people who spoke Hebrew and they understood what it meant. When He introduced Himself as El Shaddai, which is simply our English pronunciation of a Hebrew term, they understood what that meant because they spoke the language. It meant the Almighty God. And it's a lot uh, more plain and clear for us to refer to Almighty God referring because that tells us something. That tells us that the God we serve has all might and all power. We know that the God we serve is the eternal, the ever-living, the self-existent one. We know that, uh, that that He possesses all of these various characteristics through which He reveals Himself in the Scriptures. So when it talks about knowing God's names... It has to do with an understanding of the attributes, the character, the nature of God. They that know your name, those who really know you, who understand your nature, your character, your attributes, will put their trust in you. Because God will not forsake those that seek Him. So knowing God means knowing knowing the attributes, the nature, the character of God. God reveals Himself to us through the creation. He reveals Himself to us through His intervention uh, in nature. He reveals Himself to us through the historical, uh, His historical revelation in God's great actions and great exploits in times past of which the record is preserved that we might understand from generation to generation. God reveals and makes Himself knowable to us through His names, which through their meaning convey to us an understanding of God and His attributes, His nature, His character. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, here's a little more about how God makes Himself knowable to us. We live in a world of expanding technical knowledge, but we live in a world of diminishing knowledge of God and His truth. There's an explosion of technical knowledge, but a dearth of the knowledge of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except for the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but for the Spirit of God. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It is not even entered into the mind of man the things that God has determined for those that love Him. The great plan, the great purpose of God, the great awesome destiny that God has for us, to literally be born into His family at the resurrection to inherit all things, that is something that we would not be able to understand except that God reveal it to us in the Scriptures. Except that God reveal and make it knowable. And God has chosen to do so. You know, it's not something that you can arrive at just on the basis of human knowledge. But God has revealed these things to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Spirit of God is the means by which God conveys to us His mind. It's what enables us to tune in to the great God of the universe. You know, we're told in verse 12, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. Now, we've not received the spirit of the world. There is a spirit that permeates this world, that permeates this society. Satan the devil is that wicked spirit that even now works in the children of disobedience. And that spirit, that wicked spirit that works in the children of disobedience, the spirit that permeates this world and this society, That is not the Spirit that we have received. We have access to the Spirit of God. We have the... the, With God's help, we can tune in to a different frequency. This room right now is filled with various frequencies. If you had a radio, you could tune in to certain ones. Television, you could tune in to certain ones. 
frequencies that you and I cannot perceive with our unaided physical senses. You know, a dog's ears are pitched to a different uh, frequency range in terms of sound. You, they have what they call dog whistles that you can blow and you and I couldn't hear it. So it sounds silent, you, like there's no sound. But a dog can hear it a long ways away because his ear is pitched to a different range of frequency. Some of us may have certain sounds that we can't hear because that range of frequency is outside of our, uh, of our range. And, and yet others may be able to hear certain ones of those. There is a certain range that is, can be perceived by the natural man. There is a range outside the perception of any human being and it is only the Spirit of God that enables us to tune in. It is by the Spirit of God that we're able to tune in on God's wavelength and to be attuned to the mind of God. Now, God has revealed these things to us by His Spirit. What man knows the things of a man except for the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man except for the Spirit of God. Well, the thing that sets the human mind apart from the animal brain and that makes human knowledge knowable is the spirit in man. The distinction between the animal brain and the human mind is a vast gulf. If you were to line up, maybe go to a biology lab or something, or to line up uh, the brain of a cat, uh, the brain of a chimpanzee, and the brain of a human being, you would find that there's not a whole lot more difference in the brain of a human being and that of a chimpanzee than there is between the brain of a chimpanzee and the brain of a cat. In terms of, of uh, size and complexity, uh, there are similarities, and the chimpanzee is a little bigger and, and a little more complex than the cat's brain, and the human brain is a little bit bigger and a little more complex than the chimpanzee's brain. But the gulf that exists between the human mind and the chimpanzee brain is far more vast than the little gap between the intelligence of a cat and the intelligence of a monkey. There's just a little gap. There's a vast gulf between the human mind and the chimpanzee brain. Something that cannot be accounted for apart from a spirit essence in the human brain that imparts the power of human intellect that enables man to tune in on a higher wavelength that sets the human mind apart from the animal brain. No man can know the things of a man except for the spirit of a man which is in him. That sets the human mind apart from the animal brain. Even so, the things of God knows no man except for the spirit of God. So the spirit of God is what makes the things of God knowable to human beings. It's what enables the human mind to perceive spiritual knowledge. Because apart from God's spirit, the human mind can't really perceive and understand human knowledge. Paul goes on to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. He that is spiritual judges or discerns all things, yet he himself is judged or discerned of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he might instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We can have the very mind of Christ in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that tunes us in and makes us receptive to God's mind. His thought process. Someone who is spiritually minded is able to discern all things. He's able to understand physical things and he's able to understand spiritual things. Someone, but he himself is not understood by any because, uh, you know, just with the carnal mind, just with the spirit of man, you're only able to understand things on the human level. With the spirit of God, when God's spirit is there, you have understanding on the human level, but you also have understanding on the spirit level when God's spirit is working with you and is opening your mind to understand spiritual things. Natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. 
you know, someone, if, if God is not working with someone, then spiritual things make no sense to them. If it registers, if it clicks, if it makes sense, then God's Spirit is working with you. When it registers, when you understand, then God's Spirit is working with you to open your mind. God makes Himself knowable, and we're able to, to have a certain spiritual knowledge, a certain knowledge of God, because of God's chosen self-revelation, revealing Himself through creation, through His intervention in the world around us, through His historical working with His people. He reveals Himself to us through the attributes and traits that are even exemplified by His name or by His names, plural, because God has many names. He reveals Himself to us through His Spirit that enables us to be receptive to spiritual knowledge, to discern and comprehend spiritual things. But the knowledge of God is not simply something you can put in a book. It's not simply something that somebody else can tell you. Because ultimately, brethren, the knowledge of God is personal. Each generation must come to know God afresh. Now, the knowledge of God, there is much that is knowable about God that is consistent from generation to generation. But we have to understand that there is a vast difference between knowing about God and knowing God. There is a vast difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And that is a distinction and a difference that we need very much to grasp. Knowledge in the biblical sense is not simply theoretical, but it involves experience. To really know God means more than just having a theoretical knowledge about God. It means to have a direct personal encounter and personal experience with God. And each generation must come to know God afresh we can and should convey from one generation to the next the knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's way. But there are things that each generation must learn for themselves, that they must learn afresh. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, we read also, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. Now we have read up here in verse 7 that all the, the people served the eternal all the days of Joshua and the elders that outlived him. And Joshua died. It was 110. He was buried. And that generation, verse 10, were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which He had done for Israel. Now here we see two problems. Number one, there was a failure to convey the knowledge about God. There was a failure, there was a breakdown in transmittal of knowledge from one generation to the next. There was a failure to transmit the knowledge about God and the great works of God, and even more fundamentally, the generation not only did not know about God, they didn't know God. They had had no personal encounter with God. And that is crucial. A generation arose which knew not God. This has always been the tendency as we come down through the history of the people of God. The tendency, of course, is to institutionalize and to formalize things. And there is, a, there is something that happens from one generation to the next when the knowledge of God, the personal experience and encounter with God does not take place. And what is transmitted simply becomes empty and hollow. It becomes form without substance. Each generation must have an experience and an encounter with God afresh if the form is to have substance and reality. Let's notice in 1 Samuel, let's notice a couple of examples here as to how the, this is used. And then we're going to understand a little bit more about this encounter with God. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12, here we read 
about in verse 11, this is the story of young Samuel as he had been brought here to the tabernacle by his parents for Eli to raise. And in verse 11, Elkanah, who was Samuel's father, went to Ramah to his house. And the child, Samuel, did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. They were sons of Belial. That just, that's a, a term that just means they were sons of the devil. They were wild, lawless men. They knew not the Lord. Now here's the crucial thing. Why was their conduct wild and lawless? You go through and you read, you know, they, they thought nothing of, of stealing from the offerings that the people brought, and grabbing what they wanted. They literally commit fornica committed fornication and adultery in the very shadow of the tabernacle. Because, you see, they knew not the Lord. God wasn't real to them. They didn't know God. They had heard some things about God. They had never had a personal experience with God. They knew not the Lord. And they didn't fear the Lord. God wasn't real to them. God was remote and far off. God was not a factor in their day-to-day -day lives. They knew not the eternal. Now on over in chapter 3, we have a contrast. Here we have young Samuel, a young child, perhaps 10 or 12 years old. And this is the account here in 1 Samuel 3 that where God called Samuel. And Samuel answered, said, Here am I. And he ran to Eli. And you remember the story. You know, Eli wasn't calling him, but God was. And we're told here, we're told here that uh, uh, in verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. But you know, Samuel had a receptive heart. Samuel had a receptive mind. He had been taught the things of God and the laws of God, and he was receptive to that. And God began to deal with Samuel. Now at this point, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. He knew some things about God. He knew about God's laws and he was trying to, to do that as a young child and trying to, to uh, be pleasing to God. And God began to deal with Samuel in a personal way. A personal encounter with God. Samuel was going to come to know God. Knowledge, from a scriptural standpoint, is not simply theoretical. It's not simply something that is written in the pages of a book somewhere. Knowledge involves experience. It involves experience. The knowledge of God. Really knowing God involves a personal experience, a personal encounter with God. Now, it involves certainly learning a knowledge of God. As we learn the knowledge of God, we come, we can make progress in terms of really knowing God. The two go hand in hand. You can't really know God if you don't know the way God is, if you don't know about God. But knowing about God is merely the beginning of coming to know God. In Psalm 25, in Psalm 25, in verse 1, it says, Unto you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Let none that wait on you be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your, path, in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies. It talks about in verse 8, Good and upright is the eternal, therefore will he teach sinners his way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Now, how do we come to know about God? Who, who is it that God is going to teach? The meek will he guide. The meek will he teach. God is going to teach sinners His ways, that's right, but sinners who desire to turn from sin, who have a meek attitude, a teachable attitude, a receptive attitude. 
You know, have you ever noticed you can't teach anybody something who knows it all? We've all run into a few people that way. They knew it all. Hmm. What are you going to teach a guy like that? I don't care what. You, I don't care whether it's a secular uh, occupation or wh- or whatever it is. Uh, we've all run into a few know it alls. You can't teach a person like that anything. In the same way, you know, if God is going to teach us of His ways, we have to have an attitude of meekness, of recognizing that we can't do it, a recognition of our need for God and what He provides, and what He offers. That is a key ingredient to learning of God. To coming to a knowledge of God. And we have to come to a knowledge of God and as a stepping stone to coming to genuinely know God in a very personal sense. And that's crucial. That we need to know God in a very personal sense. Now, we see that He'll teach the meek in in Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28 and verse 9. Whom shall He teach knowledge? And whom shall He make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. So, to whom is God going to teach knowledge? Who's he going to make to understand doctrine? Those that are weaned. It takes a certain spiritual maturity. Precept must be upon precept. We've got to build one thing on something else. The knowledge of God is cumulative. The Bible is written precept upon precept, line upon line. You can't understand if you don't start with the basics and build up. You can't understand the New Testament if you don't start with the Old. Because God reveals Himself in Genesis 1.1 as the Creator, and then He goes forward and He begins to reveal His laws. When Christ came along to magnify the law, unless you understood what He was magnifying, you can't understand. You can't understand the spirit of the law without the letter of the law. The spirit of the law doesn't do away with the letter. When Christ came to magnify the commandment uh, uh, about murder and said, you've heard it said of old time, you should not murder. And then he went on to expound that the spirit of the law was you can't even harbor the spirit of hatred. Now, does the spirit of the law do away with the letter? Because you can't harbor the spirit of hatred and that's the spirit of murder. Does that mean that you can pull the trigger as long as you have a good attitude? That's silly. That's crazy. The spirit of the law goes beyond the letter. It includes the letter and goes beyond it. When Christ said, look, it's said of old time, don't don't commit adultery. I tell you, not even look on a woman to lust after her. Did he mean, well, you know, you could break the letter of the, of, of the seventh commandment as long as you just, you know, didn't think about it. That's crazy. That's insane. The spirit of the law builds on the letter. It goes beyond the letter. It includes the letter. What he said was, it's not enough simply to keep the letter. Keeping the letter is not all there is. But precept has to be based on, has to be built on precept. Line upon line, precept upon precept. It builds, it expands. And we have a deeper knowledge and understanding and insight into God's nature. We can understand God more fully. So, this is a crucial matter. It takes spiritual maturity. How do you develop spiritual maturity? You know, back in, uh, back in the New Testament, we're told about that, that uh, meat belongs to those who are full age. Uh, in other words, who are able to digest uh, something a little more, uh, a little more substantial. A little baby can only digest milk, uh, and the digestive system has to develop to be able to handle something a little more substantial. And it's defined. Uh, Paul defines it as those who, by reason of exp- who by reason of use, have exercised their senses to the discerning of good and evil. In other words, they have learned the law and have sought to apply it in real life, everyday experience. 
Some of you have worked in technical areas and you have received instruction. If you're going to operate heavy equipment, somebody had to give you instruction. And they pointed out and they said, you pull this lever and you do this and you do that. And they gave you some instructions and then they put you up there and you had to start trying to practice doing it. Now, you needed the instruction beforehand, somebody to say, yeah, that's the lever you pull. You know, that's, this will raise it up, this will let it down, this will turn it, this will do that. You get some instruction, but that doesn't make you an expert. You have to put some practice into actually doing it, and you begin to get a feel for it. You begin to learn how to take that theoretical knowledge and make it practical through use and experience. You begin to develop, and, and you can apply that in any field of human endeavor. No matter what it is, somebody gave you some instructions, or whether it's how to bake a cake or how to sew a skirt or, or, or how to, uh, uh, you know, you name it, how, how to build something, whatever it may be. You got some instructions, somebody showed you, but then as you began to put it together with practical experience and you began to try it, you learned how to put the two together. And that's the way we develop maturity in the Christian life. We learn and study from God's Word, and then as we try to put it into practical effect in our lives, we gain experience in how to apply the law of God in our dealings with our neighbor, in our dealings with our husband, with our wife, with our parents, with our children, uh, with, with other brethren, with people with whom we work. Whatever it may be, we gain practical experience and insight in terms of how these principles apply in a very practical, down-to-earth way of doing. And it takes experience. That's the way that's that's the way spiritual maturity is developed. And we learn and we come to a knowledge. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Well, we will grow in knowledge as we are trying to put into practice in our daily lives, the principles we have, and we build knowledge step by step, precept upon precept, line upon line. Knowledge builds cumulatively. You can't sweep away, you know, the Protestant world wants to sweep away the Old Testament and claim the new. Well, the reality, of course, if you sweep away the old, you really don't have the new either because they don't understand the new. You can't understand the new without the old. That's the basis. It's like you try to pick up an algebra textbook when you never studied the... You never learn how to count. Be sort of foolish. Every, knowledge is cumulative, and spiritual knowledge is cumulative. Well, as we go forward, let's let's notice a little more about to, to whom God will teach knowledge in Isaiah fifty-five. Isaiah fifty-five. In verse six, seek you the Lord while He may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the eternal, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts." If we want to grow in the knowledge of God, we've got to seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He's near. We've got to exercise our effort to take advantage of God's availability. Seek you the Lord while He may be found. We do that by forsaking our ways. Forsaking our thoughts. Because God says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts and my ways aren't your ways. So if we want to gain the knowledge of God, we've got to turn away from our ways and embrace God's ways. We've got to want God to put His ways in us. We've got to want to replace our ways with God's ways. To come to genuinely know God. To seek Him. Because God's Word is going to accomplish what He purposes. Learning a knowledge of God has to do with building in a cumulative sense, developing through use and experience the application of the principles of God's law in our life. Having a meek attitude, a teachable attitude, a desire to turn from our ways and to turn to God's way. 
to come to really know God. You know something, brethren? In the process, God comes to know us. You know that God is coming to know us. Now, God knows a lot about us. God knows us to begin with. He tells us in Psalm 139, He knows us even better than we know ourselves. But you know, God is interested in continuing to, to come to know us and helping us to come to know ourselves. That's a part of knowing God too. In Psalm 139, in verse 1, it says, O Lord, You have searched me and known me. Psalm 139, verse 1, You've searched me, You've known me. You know my down-sitting and my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. You compass my path and my lying down, and you're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You beset me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, and I can't attain to it. Where will I go from your spirit? Where will I flee from your presence? If I ascend up to heaven, you're already there. If I go down and make, make, make my bed in the grave and Sheol, you you're there too. You know, I can't hide from you there. If I take the winds of the morning, the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, go to the most remote island in the Pacific Ocean, even there shall your right hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night will be light about me. The darkness hides not from you, the night shines as the day. Darkness and light are both alike to you. You know, God sees as well at night as he does in the daytime. Uh, that comes as a shock to some people, you know. They, it's like uh, they wait till dark. They don't think anybody will see them. Do their little dirty dozen after the sun goes down. God's got real good night vision. You know, he, he doesn't need to eat his carrots or anything. Uh, he, he sees just as well at night as he does in the daytime. You know, some of these, little, these dimly lit uh, uh, dives where, where people, uh, people go. You know, it's sort of dark and dim. You can't see very far and... People sort of feel emboldened to act there in ways that they wouldn't want to act out in the bright noonday sun. You know what? God sees just as well in those places as He does in bright daylight. God knows us. He knows our down, our down sitting and our uprising. He knows us inside out. He sees what goes on. God knows us better than we know ourselves, and He'll help us get to know ourselves. And God deals with us to come to know us even more deeply. See, there's nothing that we can hide from God, and God sometimes allows us to be tempted and tried so that He might come to know us more fully. Now, God knew certain things about Abraham. God dealt with Abraham, and He called Abraham. And he worked with him over a period of time, and as he was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, God said in, in uh, Genesis 18 and verse 17, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the eternal." to do justice and judgment that the Eternal may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of. God says, I know him. I know that I can count on Abraham to transmit the knowledge of me and my ways to the next generation. I know that I will be able to fulfill the promises that I have made to the family of Abraham because I know Abraham well enough to know that he's going to do his part. Now on back in Genesis chapter 22, we have the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. And God put Abraham to the test. That's what we're told. God put Abraham to the test. In Genesis 22, 1, it came to pass after these times, these things, that God did test. The King James says tempt, but the word, the real sense of it is try or test or prove. You know, the book of James tells us that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. Uh, the, the English word tempt carries with it the, the uh, connotation of trying to cause someone to fail. And it was not God's intention for Abraham to fail. Uh, God tested. He put to the test Abraham and told him to take his son to a mountain in the land of Moriah and to sacrifice him. And as Abraham prepared to do that, stretched forth his hand in verse 10, the angel of the Lord called out in verse 11, 
And in verse 12 said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do you anything unto him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son. Now I know that you fear God. Abraham lift, lifted up his eyes and God began to speak to him, to tell him through here through the angel who was transmitting the message. By myself have I sworn, verse 16 says the Lord, because you've done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I'll multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So here we find that God said, Now I know. God put Abraham to the test. God allows us to be tested and tried in various ways to come to really know us. He knows everything about us. He knows our down sitting and our uprising. He knows what's going on in our thoughts and in our innermost being as we think and reason and, and, and the things that we do in the darkness or the daylight. It's all one to God. He sees and He knows. God allows certain tests and trials to bring us to grips with certain things and to help us to come to genuinely know God and to let God come to really know us. That's part of why we go through the trials of the Christian life. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Israel of old was told, You shall remember all the way, this is Deuteronomy 8 too, You shall remember all the way which the Eternal your God led you these forty years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. Why did God allow them to go those 40 years in the wilderness? To humble them and to prove them. To humble them, He put them in a situation where they were faced with their lack of self-sufficiency. You know, that's what it means to humble us. God puts us in a situation where we have to be confronted with our inability to take care of ourselves where we are confronted with our total, utter lack of self-sufficiency. Secondly, God proves us. He wants to know what's in our heart. What's really in our heart. How much do we really want to obey God? Do we really want to obey Him with all our heart? God allows us to get into situations to find out what's really in our heart. What would we get by with if we thought we could? What would we get by with if we thought no one else was looking? Because God wants to know us and to know how deeply we know Him. You see, God is in the process of teaching us about ourselves and about our relationship with Him. Because our relationship with Him the ultimate sense is based not merely on knowledge about God. We need knowledge about God, and that's important. But knowledge about God is insufficient. What we need is a personal encounter and experience with God that is based upon and builds upon a knowledge of God. We need a knowledge of God and to go beyond that to a genuine knowing God. Now, our encounter and our experience with God is made possible through Jesus Christ. He came to reveal the Father that we might have deeper understanding and insight. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It is through Jesus Christ that we're able to have direct access to the Father that we're able to have direct personal experience and encounter with God. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Often we think of this as the love chapter, and it certainly is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 9, we're told, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Right now, our knowledge on any subject is limited. Our knowledge of God is limited. Our knowledge of God's ways is limited. It's limited because hopefully we understand a little more today than we did last week or last year. 
And hopefully next year we'll understand even more, de- more deeply. We know in part, we prophesy in part. There are many things that we can know and understand about God, but it's partial knowledge. God reveals Himself to us and we can know those things, but we understand it partially because we're limited. The limit is not God, the limit is us. There's only so much we can absorb. We prophesy in part. We understand the general overview of prophecy, but there are details that we can't fully grasp until they begin to emerge and come together. When that which is perfect, that which is complete is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When you see the completion, when you see the finality of some of these things, then the partial knowledge uh, is over with and you're able to, to understand in detail. When I was a child, Paul wrote, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. He lacked experience, and he dealt in an inexperienced way. As he matured, he gained experience. And even so, in a spiritual sense, we are to mature and develop spiritually to gain spiritual experience. Now, we see through a glass darkly. But then, in the resurrection... Face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Our knowledge of God right now is limited. It's like Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. It's like, it's like looking through a, uh, you know, a smoked glass. Now, if you look at something through smoked glass, you can see shape. Uh, you can see an outline of, of shape. You can see movement. Uh, you can see many things. But there are details you can't distinguish. You can't see every, uh, every detail of color and all of the details because you can, you're seeing, you're looking through a smoked glass. And Paul said that's the way our knowledge of God is. There's a lot that we can understand. But it's like we're looking through a smoked glass because our human minds are limited. They're finite. And there are things that we can't comprehend. We can see and know a certain amount, but when the time comes that this mortal puts on immortality, that this flesh is transformed into spirit, when we see Him face to face, then we'll be able to know God even as we are known. Can you imagine that? That we'll be able to know God in the same way God knows us. Now, God knows us and He's proving us and testing us. And He's enabling us to grow in our knowledge of Him. And it's gradual and it develops. But it's still partial. It's still like looking through a, through a smoked glass. There's a lot that you can see. But when you take away the smoked glass, there's so much more. You know, if you had dark sunglasses on in here, you could look around and you could see a lot of things. You could count the people in the room. You could tell a lot of things. But you know, there's a lot of detail and a lot of color that you really wouldn't be able to clearly distinguish unless you took those off. And when you did, there'd be whole, there'd be more things. There, there would be uh, far greater depth and, and, and detail that you'd be able to perceive. When in the resurrection, you know, it says... John says in 1 John 2, he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. When we're literally born into the family of God, we will see Him as He is in full glory. And we will be able to know even as we are known. On over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's understand a little more about our growing in the knowledge of God. Coming to know God more deeply and more fully. Here in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul uh, mentions the example of how when Moses obtained the law from Mount Sinai, from God on Mount Sinai, he went up the mountain, he was in the presence of God. He came back down the mountain, and after having been in the presence of God for 40 days, his face glowed. His face glowed. The glory of God shone forth. And the people were so overwhelmed by it that they couldn't even look at him. And so he put on a veil, and wore a veil over his face until gradually this, this bright, shining countenance began to fade. And Paul uses that as an analogy, and he says in verse 14 of, first, of 2 Corinthians 3, Their minds were blinded. 
For until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. Even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So he's talking here specifically of the Jewish community that when they heard the law read, they really didn't get the point. So they really didn't get the point. They only saw a certain amount, but they really didn't get the point. They did not grasp the spirit of the law, the real glory. Just like they couldn't look on Moses' face, it's like there's a veil over their mind, but that veil is done away in Christ. Christ came to magnify the law. Verse 16, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, understand, he, he describes here, it's like you're looking into a mirror, he said, and the glory of the Lord is reflected. The reflection of God. And we see by comparison our reflection. And there is a transformation that is taking place as we are changed from glory to glory, progressively taking on the countenance, the configuration of the very nature of God. There's a transformation that is being undergone. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are coming to know God and to truly become like God. Because that's what really knowing God is involves, is really becoming like God, having His nature, His character inscribed in us. In 1 John chapter 2, in verse 3, Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that says, I know Him and keeps not His commandments is a liar and the truth's not in Him. Hereby we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. The law of God is a reflection of the mind, the nature, and the character of God. And it is through the law of God that we understand and come to really know God. Jesus Christ came and He personified the Word of God. He lived every aspect. And we have His example. In Jeremiah chapter 31, there's a prophecy. A prophecy of coming to genuinely know God, which is what the new covenant is all about. He that says he knows him ought to keep his commandments, we're told. Well, let's notice in Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I took with their fathers, that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. The time of the complete fulfillment and culmination of the new covenant is yet ahead. Right now, God has begun to make the new covenant with the first fruits. You see, he that says, I know him ought to keep his commandments because to really know God is to know his nature. And God writes His laws in our hearts and in our minds under the Old Covenant. The law of God was written with the finger of God in tables of, on tables of stone. The people knew about God, but they lacked that personal encounter and personal experience with God in the vast, overwhelming majority of cases. Today, we have the opportunity to come to genuinely know God. We can learn about God through the ways of the means of His self revelation, through the creation, through the historical examples in the scriptures, through His laws and His ways, through all the things by which God makes manifest and reveals His nature 
His ways, through the Holy Spirit opening our hearts and in our minds. As each generation afresh must come to go beyond simply a knowledge about God in a theoretical sense, but a personal experience with, a personal encounter with God coming to really know God and to walk with God, having God's laws written in our hearts and in our minds as we yield to Him, as we seek Him. And the basis of our life and our action is based on coming to genuinely know God. And the time is going to come. As God is working in the first fruits right now, making the new covenant, writing His laws in our hearts and in our minds, that in the world tomorrow, in the time to come, as God makes that new covenant with all humanity, and all will know God. No longer will people have to say to their neighbor or to their brother, know the Lord, because God says they'll all know Him. They'll all know. They'll know God's laws and God's ways, and those will be written in their hearts and in their minds. And we will be at the point that is described by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 in verse 9. Prophetic of the world of, of the time in the future, the world tomorrow, when they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the eternal as the waters cover the sea. The knowledge of God and His way the knowledge of the Lord will permeate the earth, will fill the earth the way the waters cover the sea. Brethren, we need to come to know God more fully, more deeply. We live in a world that is beset with a paradox, a multiplication of knowledge and information, and yet an absolute dearth and lack of the knowledge of God because humanity has rejected God and His laws and His ways. We have access. God is knowable because He makes Himself knowable. We must respond. We must seek Him and serve Him. And encounter and experience our God in a personal relationship as we walk with Him and come to have His laws and His ways more deeply embedded in our hearts and in our minds as we anticipate the time to come when the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea.